Um, this is the first of three public Q&A sessions that I'm doing this week. Um, so we're talking about sound system design, sound system optimization, Proteo Workshop seeing sound, working on shows, mixing, beer, chocolate, whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, so for those of you who are here with us live, feel free to unmute yourself and just talk and ask questions and join the conversation um, whenever you would like. That's what we're here to do, answer questions and um, support the community. And those of you who are watching on Facebook, I'm just pointing to my other monitor over here. Um, if you have questions or comments, um, you can type them into the chat box down there. If you want to join us live on Zoom, go to the event page for this sound system tuning Q&A, and you'll be able to use your camera and your microphone to talk to Mike and I. So I invited Mike here because um, not only does he have a lot of experience being a sound engineer, working on shows, doing designs, but he has also been through one or two of my courses. You've done Proteo Workshop Seeing Sound, right, Mike? Correct. Yeah. Cool. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your experience there, maybe some things that you've learned, and then how you kind of applied them in your job. But um, first of all, what's your background in audio? Did you go to some sort of audio school or a university or study music? What's your experience there? I did, yeah. Um, I went to, I got a Bachelor of Science in uh, Audio Production and Media Technology uh, from one of the Art Institute's uh, branches uh, that was in Brookline, um, Massachusetts. And um, yeah, so it was finished the whole thing in three years because I went, I, you know, I took summer semesters and just worked through it and everything and um, wow, okay. ended up being great because they had, you know, the career services department, the a bunch of my professors, they all had connections around town. And, you know, I wouldn't have had any other way of getting my foot in the door of the industry any other way because I didn't, I didn't know anybody. Um, so I just, through internships and, you know, meeting people, um, ended up uh, with a pretty uh, diverse career with, you know, concert sound and corporate and a little bit of install and everything. So it worked out. I'm glad you pointed that out because whenever people ask me whether they should or shouldn't go to school or what sort of their educational paths should be. I don't really have a great answer, except that I've heard from a lot of people, including Chris Leonard, who's also here with us today, because I interviewed him on the podcast, that um, one of the best things that they got out of going to school was just making connections, and that's where they got their first jobs. Mm. Um, so it seems like that worked out for you as well. Sure did. Cool. Um, all right. Well, I know we don't have a lot of time with you, so let me get to some of the questions I wanted to ask you about the course. How did you first hear about Priority Workshop Seeing Sound? Well, I think it was um, probably a plug from something like this. Uh, you've had, I don't know if they were public uh, webinars, but you had maybe some pay-to-play webinars that I first uh, was, you know, watching, uh, I guess it was almost two years ago now. Um, and this was all an extension of the podcast, which was the first, uh, you know, Nathan Lively branded thing that I heard about. And from that led to the webinars. And then I believe the, web the webinars led to, oh, hey, by the way, I have this awesome six month, you know, online course. And it was exactly what I was looking for. Oh, cool. Well, that's what I was going to ask you first. You say it's exactly what you're going to look looking for, but um, I know that no course or educational experience can be perfect for any one person unless it's truly one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm curious if there was maybe a hesitation or obstacle you thought about before you signed up. Like, were you wondering, you know, am I going to have enough time to work on this? Is it too expensive? Will it include lessons that are actually applicable to me? What sort of question was on your mind there before you signed up? Well, it was, the price was pretty much the only obstacle. And I ended up saying, Hey, I may as well go ask, you know, the owner of the company, will you pay for this? And the worst, the worst he could have said was no. Right. And he said, yes. And, and that was it. Uh, I, oh, you know, wow. I knew, I knew from the, I, you, you must've had a dedicated web page or something for it. Cause mm -hmm. reading through, you know, what you're going to get in this course it, 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 like I said, it sounded exactly like something that I would, I would want. And, um, and I didn't really realize it at the time, but the whole thing is basically scientific method of setting up sound systems. And that was one thing that, you know, no matter how good your ear is, you really can't do that perfectly without this method. So, um, it filled that gap for sure. Great. I, I just really like the fact that 
you ask for help, you ask for support from your boss, and he probably had, he or she had probably had no idea who I am, but they're like, education sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then what did you discover after you actually signed up? Because I know you had this sort of question, like, is it really, is, is it really worth the money? Um, it sounds like you were looking for something based on the scientific method and that's what you discovered. Did you want to say anything else about what you discovered after actually enrolling? Yeah, I mean, well, it's so, uh, you know, it's based, based uh, heavily off Bob McCarthy's not only book, but sort of his nomenclature and his, uh, you know, methods and everything. And yeah, I read the book a couple of times, but it, it only so much sunk in and I wasn't applying each little paragraph to my next job, you know what I mean? But with the course, it's broken into lessons. So you have a homework assignment. And, you know, I was in a production company while I took it. And literally it was like, okay, well, we got to find, uh, you know, how to set these two speakers at Unity Display. And oh, by the way, on Friday, I'm in a hotel ballroom. I have four speakers. I need to set them at Unity Display. Well, may as well do it and see what, you know, real life in the field uh, applications. And it, it was just hand in hand. And I never felt, uh, like it was too difficult or anything. Um, not that, it, you know, some of those lessons or those homework lessons took hours to do. And sometimes, you know, all right, well, I don't have a 14 box, you know, Leo line array, but I, Hey, I can do it in map. And, uh, you know, it's, it's this, almost the same thing. So, um, between the design tools and the methods and then the whole analyzer <laughs> instructions, I mean, it completely just revolutionized what I was doing. So, Wow. Awesome. Yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, I, the first thing I caught on to that you said was about reading Bob McCarthy's book. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it make Chris's job easier if each new person that came in that he had to work with, he could just say, here's this book. And then they would read it. And then the next day they would be ready to do anything in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we, we all kind of wish that would happen. And, um, that's the first book that I recommend to anyone. I'm reading it for the third time now. Um, so that's Bob McCarthy's Sound System Design and Optimization. And um, it's just a process that happens over some years, would you say? Like you understand a little bit more as you go along yes. and then actually apply it in the field. Absolutely. I think I'm on my third time reading it as well. Um, but, you know, every time... I go over it again. It's like, oh, all right. Well, I've, I've done half of these things before. I know exactly what he's talking about at this point from, awesome. from the lessons. So. Yeah. So um, before you go, Mike, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share some of the stuff you've been working on. So through reading Bob McCarthy's book, Don Davis's book, taking priority workshop, seeing sound, you have been writing your own articles that you publish on LinkedIn and your own website, which are great. And everyone should check out. Um, when I get a chance to, I'll put that into the comments for this live stream on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. If you, um, if they just want to search my name on LinkedIn, that'll, that's like the hub for everything. So just Michael Reed, find my okay. profile. It's got all the articles. It's got my company page and everything. It's all right there. Um, so do you have a couple of those calculators that you made open on your computer right now? Could you? I do. Yeah, I can, uh, I can switch over here to show screen. Uh, let's see. So at the top or the bottom? I just want to prepare oh, sure. everyone for Mike Reed's mouse. It's amazing. <laughs> no, this that's the desktop. This is on this is on my laptop at oh, home at my okay. work. So I it's not, uh... he has this mouse that's a little guitar, which is amazing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you see that? I see it. Okay. So um, this this particular calculator uh, came up from one of the lessons from Seeing Sound um, where I was talking about line arrays and filling the angle uh, for your audience area. And it, you know, it made sense and everything, but I thought, well, you know, if I can, because because Seeing Sound gives you the formulas and I thought, well, hey, if I just put the formulas into an Excel sheet and then leave the variables open at any job site, I can just pull this up put the variables in, it does the work for me, and then I can just go from there. Um, so just real quick, you're basically trying to find this inner triangle here. So along the audience area and back up to here and like this. So this inner part is the angle that you have to fill with your speakers. 
Um, and you find that by uh, measure, uh, walking off with uh, um, a, wheel, a wheel ruler or a laser measure and a couple of other things. So just real quickly, I can um, go through this and let's see, this is taking forever. Um, all right, so for example, let's say we had a, a six box array. Uh, we we're at 15 foot trim height. Okay, and um, we have uh, at work, we have these line arrays called the QSC wide line uh, tens and they're uh, 0.9 feet high. So it'll tell you uh, the line height is now 5.4 feet. Uh, you've got five available splay angles. So now we just we just fill in hypothetically like what these triangles are. And the first one would be your distance from directly under the hang all the way out to the last you know row in your audience uh, side B. So let's say that's 120 feet. And uh, triangle two, same thing, directly under the array to the very first seat. Uh, we'll say that's 52 feet, whatever. And so right here, we're looking, that's actually kind of extreme, but we're looking at 3.3 um, uh, degrees, which would be this angle back here. And basically, um, if you had five angles to choose from, you would need a, a 0.6, uh, a 0.6 degree display between all six of those boxes. Um, so, so, so you've actually used this in the field, I think, to estimate coverage angle and then average display between boxes, right? Correct. And the, the kind of the, this is just like a kind of a launch pad. This is like this first step because you may find that you want to not have every box the same splay angle. You may want to double up in the top boxes because they then they'll throw farther. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. And also, but, but honestly, what, what I find the most in the field is that uh, I'll have a line array that only has one processing channel for all the boxes. So I can't do separate EQ. I can't do shading. I can't do separate delay. It's I, I literally just as simple as this. I have to fill that angle. Um, and that that's as much as I can do. So a lot of times this is enough. Um, but then other times, you know, if, if you have separate zones within the array, then you can do a little bit more. Um, and this version two has, um, talks about where your far field will begin, um, the distance away and stuff like that. Um, this is still kind of being worked on. Uh, actually, I, I was looking forward to releasing this version two. This version one is available um, on my LinkedIn company page. Um, and hopefully soon this will be hammered out and I'll be able to uh, release version two. Um, so that's awesome, Mike. So if people go to LinkedIn and search for Mike Reed, and then they, from there, they get to your company page, then they can get to your website and then they can download this calculator. <laughs> Almost. Uh, so the company page, the website's gone. Um, but the company page has a link, a Google drive link. So you just copy and paste that and it's permanently being seeded. It's being shared and you can just download it from there. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do you have time to show us one more or do you have to go? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll show this one briefly. Um, so this was also uh, stemmed from a lesson in seeing sound. In fact, Nathan, these are your graphics down here um, uh, that you made. And uh, so I Oh, wait, did you switch over? We still see the first oh, calculator. Oh, uh, let's see. So you might have to do a new share. Yeah. Okay. And then the other window. Is that good? Got it. Okay, so yeah, so these are your, um, your your images that you made from the course. I just inserted them in there. Um, but uh, it ended up being that I wanted to get this uh, this equation as well um, into an Excel sheet. And the the reason I did it was for a job where we were in an ice rink downtown in the middle of the city, and uh, they put a tent up over the ice rink, and um, we had uh, two mains per side and it was covering like this dance floor and you know tent walls are not very good at containing SPL so um, I wanted to do a unity display uh, originally for each side which would have been 140 or sorry 150 degrees total because by the end of the night people are every you know they're not just on the dance floor they're everywhere um, 
but my boss showed up and was like, Hey, uh, you can't do that. Well, why? He said, well, the, the second main that's splayed out is facing directly across the street. There's this, you know, kind of ritzy hotel and they don't want to hear, they don't want to get blasted all night. Right. Thought, okay. All right. Well, uh, how do I do this? Okay. So I said, I have a solution for this. I said, I'm, I'm able to, um, find the drive level and, uh, splay angle in order to tow that outside speaker in and basically create that minimum variance line right along the edge of the tent instead of blasting right through it. Um, so there's a couple yeah, of different cool. ways, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, they were matched speakers, so I believe they're QSC 153s or something. Um, so I ended up typing in coverage of speaker A plus coverage of speaker B. Um, the distance ratio was something like 0.6, and that that talks about how far this speaker has to cover compared to how far this one has to cover, right? So if we tilt this whole thing to its side, um, this speaker here would have been covering something like 60 feet directly down the length of the tent and the lateral extension to the edge of the tent was only 20 feet um so uh, if you said farthest distance was 60 and the shortened distance was 20 it gives you okay so actually 0.33 distance ratio so if we put that in that's going to let us know that our new splay angle for these two 75 degree speakers is going to be 24 and three quarters of uh, degrees. Um, so you tow them in, you know, you get your protractor and laser, or I've actually been uh, coming to the conclusion that it's almost easier. Let's see if I can zoom in here. It's almost easier, I think, than using a protractor and a laser to measure this angle with a protractor the backs of the cabinets because they're you know it's it's just 180 degrees from the front so if you measure this you can get your angle easier um and so anyway so again let's say that this green speaker was facing directly down covering most of the range and this one was the one that's towed in to 24.75 uh, degrees well, you can't, I mean, we know that you can't have both the drive levels the same because then you're just going to get horrible comb filtering. Um, so you have to drive the new, the, the towed in speaker at minus 9.6 dB. And uh, that will create, um, you know, it's like a, a reconstructed unity splay with, with offset, basically. Um, so anyways, yeah, you are taking the symmetrical array that you had before where everything was matched. Mm -hmm. And now as you are unmatching some things like, oh, the drive level is not matched anymore. Now it's asymmetrical. Now we need to find the new splay angle. Yep, cool. exactly. So and that it worked out great. Um, no, no more complaints. And I was able to, uh, quote unquote, save the day. And my boss was happy <laughs> and it was resolved. This was one of the lessons from the from the course. So. That's awesome. And potentially no one knew that you saved the day, but you averted some disaster of, uh, you know, the ho hotel would have complained and then who knows what would have happened. <laughs> exactly. Well, no, no one knew, but uh, the Nathan Lively uh, social media um, group knew because, of course, that's the first thing I did was go back there and post in there. Hey, guys, look what I did. And everyone's like, good job. So awesome. Yeah. Um, Mike is talking about the private group that we have for students of Priority Works of Seeing Sound called Goes to Eleven, um, where people share their homework, they share the projects that they're working on, um, things that the, have happened in the past. Um, and so that's where we were originally talking about this, and that's where Mike has been sharing some of these first articles and calculators that he's been developing. So Mike, it's been really great having you being a part of that community. Um, as well as just everything you've been sharing on your LinkedIn page for free to the public. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you for doing that. And then um, I know you got to run. So thank you for being here and talking to us. And um, I don't know, have a great rest of the day. And, and yeah, as soon as you can share that version two of the calculator, let us know and, and we'll share it okay. around. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks. So Mike's taken off, but that was just the first part of this. I wanted to talk to him because he's doing some excellent work and he's been a student in the course. So I wanted you to hear about his experience there. 
Um, but now we're actually going to get into the Q&A portion. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this is the right screen. And here is the first question that I'm going to hit today. So first I want to talk about the questions um, that were sent in ahead of time. And then if we still have time, I'll try to get to some of them that you guys have been typing into the chat box. So first of all, thanks for all the people who have been here so far. It's great to see Will, Pete, James, Chris, uh, Adrian, Jason, Alice, Marcy, Bodan, Daniel, Fletcher, Anthony, Marco. Thanks for being here, you guys. So um, this person, sorry, I'm going to mess up your name, Swapnil, sent in this question. I have been studying about in-fire arrangements of subwoofers in PA from the last two to four days. Have you anything relevant to do more study on it or any formula to implement like space between two subs and how much delay we have to use according to frequency? Yes, <laughs> I have some things for you. So I'm excited that you're getting into this swap nail. And here's what I would recommend. First of all, Bob McCarthy's book. Um, we already mentioned it at the top of this meeting. There's a whole chapter on cancellation. So step one is to read Bob McCarthy's chapter on cancellation. It's actually very short. It'll probably only take you 30 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, depending on how deep you want to get at looking at these images. But one of the first things that he covers is in fire arrays. Um, just a few pages into here. Maybe I passed it already. I didn't see it. Anyway, that's the first thing, Bob McCarthy's book. The second thing I would look at is Merlin Van Veen's subwoofer array designer. This is probably the best free sandbox to play in when it comes to subwoofer array design. You can download it for free on his site, merlinvanveen.com, I believe, or merlinvanveen.nl. Um, I'll post it later in the comments. But it looks like this. And there's a bunch of stuff here, but I'm kind of zoomed in so that you can actually see some of the numbers. If I scroll down here to the right, You'll see more and more controls and boxes and information. It's a little overwhelming when you first open it, I have to admit. But if you just work your, if first of all, you read the user's manual, it comes with a PDF user's manual. Very helpful, go through that. But then you can kind of just work your way from left to right on a lot of these settings and you'll be able to start experimenting and see these relationships. Um, and the reason I'm pointing this out is that you say here, any formula to implement the spacing, if it were just two speakers, um, there is a formula and it would be quarter wavelength. So if we were just to look at two speakers here, and I'm gonna scroll over here to the right so you can actually see the speakers here and I'm gonna zoom in. How do I do that down here? Hopefully my computer doesn't crash. Okay, hopefully you can see there's two black dots here. So now we just have two speakers and you can see that a two speaker in fryer array is not a very efficient use of your time, right? All you've got here is one null and that is a characteristic of the in fryer array. The number of nulls in the rear are going to be equal to the number of elements you have minus one. So a more efficient use if you're gonna do in fryer array would be something like three, four, or five elements. Then we see we start to get some real rejection here. Um, over here in this little info box, you can see that we've got a front to back ratio of 16.5 dB, which is pretty good. All things, all other things equal. Um, that's the kind of result we should get. And now you can just start playing around with some of these settings and see how the relationship changed. Right now we have a spacing of one meter and we get this kind of shape at 100 hertz, but down here in the polar pattern, we can see that that changes per frequency. So we've got a bit of an arms race here in terms of spacing versus frequency. Now, we should be getting um, full frequency, uh, full range alignment in the front, which is why a lot of people like the in-fire array, but then it changes in the rear. So the spacing is not only going to uh, change the spacing, uh, sorry, change make a big difference in this coverage here in the rear and how much rejection you're getting, but it also changes the shape in the front. So I would invite you to just start playing around with some of these settings, um, not only adjusting the number of speakers and the spacing here, but then if you wanna get into actually matching 
seeing if you can match the shape of this coverage to whatever your room is. Like, let's say that you have a um, room or an audience plane that's something like 100 feet deep by 75 feet wide. So 100 divided by 75 is 1.33. So what is that forward aspect ratio? So I can look at my aiming triangles business card, which you can download over here. Um, I'll put a link to that since I have it into Facebook right now. Did I copy it? No. If you guys wanna grab that, you can get it there. It's just a bunch of helpful little uh, pieces of information. Anyway, I can see that on my aiming triangles business card, it says that forward aspect ratio of 1.31 is a hundred degree speakers. So if I put in 50 here, I can see that it says, oh, hundred degrees, forward aspect ratio of 1.31. Why do I want to do this? Well, if I make my microphones here match the um, coverage angle that I want to have, then I can start playing around with the spacing and look at what frequencies that spacing actually matches. So if you look at relative to mic arc here, this shows us how far away we are from 100 degrees um, coverage. And it looks like we're really close at 100 hertz, but maybe we want to actually match at 80 hertz. So we're at 18% right now, but if we go up to 1.2 meter spacing, then we're at 2%. So we get a lot closer at 80 Hertz, if that's our goal. Um, but you can see that our coverage back here starts to change. So then you've got to, you start to see that there's this balance of the coverage you get in the front, um, how much rejection in the rear, um, how many speakers do we need? How much space do we need? Therefore, the real estate. So this is just a great sandbox, as I mentioned, to play in to see about how all of these uh, things relate to each other. Step three, I think, would be to build your own array in MapXT. Now, you could take the easy route, and right over here, you can export this to MapXT, and you can open it up there. Um, but use any prediction program. If you're, I always recommend there's... There's not one prediction program that I recommend or design piece of software that I recommend uh, that does everything. So I recommend that you just be versatile in all the different design and prediction softwares out there, but most importantly, the ones that you use the most often. Okay, If you're using a lot of Meyer Sound, you should be really fluent in MapXT. Um, so every company, JBL, DMB, has their own design and prediction software. That's just kind of uh, the state of the industry. Um, so I hope that helped. That was probably more information than you needed, but basically to sum up, I recommend your next steps are Bob McCarthy's book, Merlin Denveed's Subwoofer Array Designer, and then um, build your own as a prediction in your in MapXT or any other prediction software, and then build and verify in the field. Um, these values that you come up with here, so the simplest way to use this is if you just say, hey, I want to build an in-fire array, I want the spacing to be one meter, give me all the answers, and it'll tell you over here the delays that you need. You still need to verify those in the field. They're going to be slightly different because sound doesn't necessarily go in a straight line because it can't go through these speakers. It has to go around them from the back. So without getting too much deeper into that, um, make sure that you actually verify that stuff in the field. All right, Terry sent in a question. Terry said, what is the best configuration for a podium mic? A single cardioid, two mics. I saw a video where the tech uses a single standard Shure SM58 with a small shotgun mic on the podium somewhere as a backup in case the speaker moves the SM58. My boss has a great mic, my, my boss has great mic etiquette, but we frequently get guest speakers who move the single mic or talk to the left and right of the polar pattern. So I've got all of you guys here. I've got Chris. So Chris, what do you think is the best configuration for a podium mic? Um, what is standard to do? Do you have an answer for this? Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I've tried a bunch of different mics outside of the standard. Um, you know, we typically use a MX-412, uh, 418. You know, basically, it's just the um, a 185 or 184 element. Uh, so MX-412 is just the make of either the push-to-talk or the gooseneck. 
412, 418. It's just the 12 being 12 inches, 18 being 18 inches. But really all that matters is the capsule in the end. Is It's all the same capsule. It's on a wireless law from shore. Um, so it's the uh, WL185 or 184. That's what's cardioid is 185, 184 is hypercardioid. Um, beyond that, uh, I've tried, you know, uh, five, six, $800 microphones and um, none of them give me that I have found any thing better than than what the shore does or, you know the hard on microphone um maybe a little better on plosives um but so i we've just stuck with it and, and a lot of it to me is uh, it's a distance game so uh i try to be six to nine inches from the mouth um and um uh if it's going to be closer than that you need to, you need really thick windscreens uh or a really good dynamic eq <laughs> um and um, beyond that, I mean, the shotguns worked a little bit. I, but I, I mean, I even have on my desk here the new Shore uh, shotgun uh, capsule that screws into oh, MX-412. Um, it's called a 189. Um, but I didn't notice much of a difference compared to a 184, 185. So I haven't really instituted it yet. So, uh, and we do two of them because it's a main and backup. So um, it's, you know. I wish it was something more, a more fancier, a more fancy answer, but I don't have one. <laughs> well, what do you think about Terry's question about people with bad mic etiquette? Is your first move to fix the mic etiquette, to put them on a lavalier microphone? Have you run into this problem a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends. If if a, if a presenter's only going to be there for a few minutes, you're never going to change the fact of how long, you know, that you're, you're going to have a podium mic and it is what it is. You just need to have uh, good you know, positioning of your speakers and EQ and all that stuff to kind of compensate for all that. Um, if I know a presenter is going to be behind the podium uh, for a long extended period of time uh, and are playing presenter, then my recommendation is always going to be to lob them up. Um, and, uh, but so outside of that, I mean, um, it, it, it kind of is what it is, unfortunately. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, the most common situation I run into is that a podium package arrives, which means two of the exact same microphone, you usually assure MX-412 or something similar, a cardioid pattern. And then the only thing that I've changed in the last few years is I uh, used to do two from each side like this, so I could get people moving around. And then I decided that it was more important to actually get people who are shorter and taller, because I feel like most people know how to stand in front of the lectern and be centered there, and they understand that, but they can't control how tall they are. So now I do one that's low and one that's high. Yeah. And that's worked well for me. Also, if you tape them together, then if people move them around, at least they sort of stay together. And also you can train someone else who's like the MC so that the MC comes back up and he like puts the mic back in place, even though you've told everyone not to move it, but like that can be his job. So that's what I do now. Um, I love this video from DC sound up. If you guys haven't seen it, I'm going to put it into the comments here, but basically he uses a combination between a um, super cardioid or hypercardioid, um, like 18 inch gooseneck that we're used to. And then he puts a little uh, shotgun mic, like the one Chris was just holding up below it, that's sort of hidden and you don't even see it. But if someone were, he gives a great demo that if you push the mic to the side, you switch to the shotgun mic and it's still working. So you always have a backup no matter how bad that microphone position gets. I haven't tried that yet, but I just loved his video and, and um, I thought that that was a good backup solution. Now, if you have, that's still not gonna fix your problem if you have someone that stands like way off to the side. And I think um, the only fix there is to actually put a microphone on them. I have tried doing an auto mix. Um, you know, we have Dan Dugan kind of auto mix processing on a lot of our consoles now. And I've tried doing one between the podium and the lavalier. And that ends up being weird because the if the sound isn't exactly matched on the input, then the auto mix is switching back and forth between those inputs, but they sound a little bit different. I don't yeah, recommend I, that. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, yeah, the, so the, the, reson, the, re, the, the issue with that is the resonance you get off the body versus the direct. I mean, they're the exact same capsule. So I, that's why I tell people, one EQing a podium mic, I mean, you typically, I, I'll EQ with a lav, copy and paste that over to uh, the lectern, 
um, or vice versa, because um, it's literally the same microphone. It's just the difference of it being down here versus being out in front of you. So you're already going to be 90% there um, because of how it's, it's the same capsule. That's a great point. I don't think I ever thought about that. Awesome. Um, if anyone else has any suggestions for Terry, please comment on this video. Um, but I, I think we kind of killed the most common ideas and this new one I think is pretty cool. Um, so to wrap up, Terry had a second question. What is the best free RTA software? I'm using RumiQ Wizard. Everything else is over $500 for personal use. Um, so I was hoping Mike could stick around, but he's a busy guy and he had to go. Why he uses RumiQ Wizard and he's been using it his entire professional career and he used it all the way through Pro Day Workshop Seeing Sound. I don't use RumiQ Wizard, but um, I've done a few things with it and they keep updating it and supporting it. So I think for free, it's been around the longest. It seems to be the most stable, has the most features. Now for someone who's new, it might be a little bit harder to get up and running. Probably Mike would disagree with me on that because uh, he uses it a lot, but I found it a little bit difficult to get up and running. So I would recommend that new people also check out Open Sound Meter. You open it up and it kind of immediately starts working. It looks more like smart. So if you are used to that kind of layout, it could be f more familiar. Um, I like Rita a lot. It has a lot of the features that you only get in like a uh, $1,400 audio analyzer like FIR capture in that it has um, the ability to insert filters. So you've got uh, like a filter bank there and you can do some experiments there after you take measurements. The only reason why I haven't used it more and done more videos about it is that I've had a hard time finding a stable version of it. I've been in contact with Pepe Ferreira and other people who use it and they keep trying to help me. I don't know if I just have my computer's too old or I don't have the right pieces, but occasionally I get it to work and occasionally I don't. So I definitely recommend it. You can still get it for free uh, from, they have a new website just dedicated to basically Reader right now, I think. Um, but it's a great piece of software and uh, I think it has a, a really bright future in terms of, uh, I think the stuff Pepe Ferrer is trying to do with it um, is really cool. And like I said, I don't know any other piece of software outside of FIR Capture that's $1,400 that can do the kind of, um, playing with filters that you can do and read it. So that's my suggestion for a basic free RTA. Um, if anyone else here listening has a suggestion, put it into the comments for this video. Also remember that you can get demo versions of Smart, SatLive, FIR Capture, you know, everything else, uh, SysTune, all come with, you know, 30 day demos. So you could use a demo for 30 days and test out each of those. And you know, after six months, maybe you would know which one you liked and you would save up enough money um, so we need to wrap up soon. Let me see if I can grab one or two of the questions that people typed in because I like that you guys were here. Um, James says, thoughts on engineers grabbing an old measurement EQ and trying to EQ their system without prior training and experience. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I think you should do that at home though. Um, you don't want to be charging your clients for your own education and doing a lot of learning out in the field and potentially making a mess um, and annoying somebody else and stuff like that. So yes, don't worry about the training. Start right away. Get experience on your own, but do it at home, right? Where you can make a mess and sort of learn the software. You don't want to show up out in the field using your software for the first time. There was a great moment in my interview with um, Pat Brown where I asked him what the biggest mistake was. And he said he gets calls pretty regularly where people say, okay, Pat, um, I'm here in the room. I just opened my audio analyzer. What do I do? And his answer is always pack it all back up, take it back home and practice at home. <laughs> so I hope that doesn't sound uh, too dismissive. Um, let me see if there's a couple of other easy, easy ones I can grab and then we'll wrap up. Okay.
Okay, I don't think there's any other. So Swapnik, I, Swapnil, I see your question. I'm going to write you a text answer later so I can ask you some follow-up questions. All right, this has been really fun, you guys. Um, I've got two more of these coming up throughout the week. So if you guys want to submit more questions, I would be happy to um, try to answer them for you. If you speak Portuguese, we have another one coming up in about 14 minutes that's going to be in Portuguese, and you can see me potentially make a fool of myself trying to speak Portuguese. That'll be fun. Um, anyway, thanks for being here, Chris, and chiming in a little bit, and um, hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>